Hello and welcome to Hollow Lodge Girls College BBC School News Report. Today's headlines are Merseyside is experiencing the sharpest rise in house prices of anywhere in Britain. Lionel Messi was celebrating last night after scoring three goals against Chelsea's capital of the Champions League. Tributes are still pouring in from Professor Stephen Hawkins, who sadly passed away yesterday morning. And today's main topics are we love all kinds of sports here at Holly Lodge, but we're constantly reminded about the lack of profile towards women in sports. We spoke to our PE teacher here at Holly Lodge and asked her about her views on the subject. Okay, um, I think sport is a fantastic thing. I think I think that girls especially, it can be something to release their emotions, it can be something to make friends, it can be something to develop different skills um, and Doing something outside of school means that you're a little bit more engaged with the community um, and you're making other friends outside of school than just the ones inside of school as well. We were lucky enough to speak to some sports women, Leave Charles and Satara Murray from Liverpool Ladies. I played with uh, boys a lot growing up so I didn't get into centre or girls football till quite late on so that was a barrier in terms of straight away the boys didn't like that there was a girl playing on the team that I was playing for so They'd, be, they'd not like it, they'd take offence to it and try and do something about it, whether that was off the ball, just shouting at me, giving me little pushes off the ball, but it helped me become more robust, deal with it as a player, as, as a person as well. When I was growing up in the girls' game, there, there were, if you'd looked, you could find role models, but they weren't necessarily easily accessible or in your face. The women's national team doing so well in the World Cup back in 2015. Um, I think that really put women's football in general on the map and it really, you know, inspired, you know, the, the younger generation to get out there and play. When you see, you know, such great players um, going out there and, and putting women's football, especially for England on the map, on such a massive stage like the World Cup, it can really, um, it can really be a big help. But in comparison to the men, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that go into, you know, with the men, the more they get paid, the, the fame, the the power they have is, is, is way up there. But, um, you know, I think women's football has come a long way, still had a really long way to go. Here's what two other inspirational sports women have to say, Carolyn Reed and Jenna Downey. Uh, it was an absolute honour to make it to an Olympic Games to represent um, Great Britain. It was always my dream to compete at Olympics. I think it's down to, to people like myself who's who's been an athlete but is now retired from the sport that I'm passionate about. I'm now a full-time teacher. I think it's down to people who have reached the pinnacle of their career to actually go out and inspire young people to keep doing and pursuing their dreams. I would say my sport of inline skating can be quite an intimidating sport to take part in. You go to a skate park like I do and it's filled with boys full of tattoos so it can be quite an intimidating place to be but i would say just give it a go you will get so much respect for having a go it's such a supportive friendly atmosphere a really really positive place to be and everybody helps and supports each other so i would say have the confidence to just give it a go and it's not half as bad as what you think it might be so it seems the profile of women's sports is gradually on the increase, but we still have a way to go. So for the time being, we're going to stick to our sports here at Holly Lodge. Next story was inspired by the amount of homeless people we see every day in the streets here in Liverpool. We know homelessness is something many people face in a range of ways. But what exactly does it mean to be homeless? And what provisions are here in Liverpool to help people facing these struggles? We spoke to representatives from two local based projects, the Whitechapel Centre and Liverpool Homeless Football Club, who both tackled this issue in very different ways. Um, the club was set up in 2007. Uh, initially it was just for a couple of hostels we were playing football against each other. Uh, and that kind of uh, developed now we have um, 26 hostels across Merseyside playing football. The football is the carrot for us, so once we've engaged homeless people, um, using football, then we can look at um, other issues. Um, well, I became homeless in 2012 and um, due to a family breakdown and then I was in a hostel that John Fergum was working in and he asked me to come along to these football sessions that were going on and um, went along 
there was also trials for the homeless world cup going on at the same time got trials for that um went to manchester where they picked eight to eight women and eight men to go on to the homeless world cup in mexico and i was one of the eight women lucky enough uh, so the White Chapel Centre works with the Liverpool and Merseyside and it provides um, different uh, solutions for someone who's homeless. So we've got uh, an enablement centre um, that is open to rough sleepers where they can go and get um, things like breakfast, a shower, a fresh pair of clothes, but we also run activity sessions, have um, housing advice, we also have welfare advice to help them get access to benefits, um, as well as medical services there. And we also have an overnight shelter where someone who is sleeping can go in the evening. Uh, so there's lots of different things that we do to help someone who is homeless or worried about becoming homeless. There's a variety of reasons why people become homeless, um, from domestic abuse to people leaving care to parents asking people, should their kids to leave for, if they're using drugs or whatever. But there, there is a variety, people have having breakdowns. Uh, we've seen a large number of veterans coming in, into um, leaving the forces uh, with PTSD, um, not being able to cope in a normal life. Uh, so we've seen a lot, large number of them on the streets now. So th there is a variety of reasons, there isn't one kind of, one reason why people become homeless. Well, I was quite shocked at the wide variety of people I was meeting and the different age groups, the different backgrounds. So there wasn't all people with addictions, there were people who had might have had good jobs but things had happened. Like I know like before I was homeless, like my view on people who were homeless was like big like scary men who were like on drinking drugs, but it like people don't realise that it really is anyone can become homeless, like anyone literally. Like most people, they're only like one payday away from like losing their homes and becoming just homeless, just like us. And if any children and young people want to help us in the future, we have uh, a Liverpool Cathedral sleep out uh, that takes place in April the 6th this year. So uh, it's like our Liverpool sleep out that takes place outside every October, but it's open to anybody of any age. And it's taking place in Liverpool Anglican Cathedral. Um, so there'll be lots going on on the night. Our final story is one very close to the heart to staff, students and the BBC School News Report team here at Holly Lodge and is inspired by 17 year old Adam Clift. As a teenager Adam became severely ill and one of the treatments he received during this time was stem cell treatment. We want to know more about this and why his family now campaigned to raise awareness of stem cell donations. Here is Mr Clift, our assistant head and science teacher. Well, it's a huge area of medical research at the moment and to understand all the different potential you have to understand that stem cells are the types of cells in our body that can turn into every other really complex cell. So when our bodies go wrong, the theory about stem cell research is we can almost do sort of bespoke repairs on it. So the future looks very interesting. But my personal interest in stem cell research was um, over a condition that my son had where he had something called a stem cell transplant to treat a blood cancer. I think he'd have liked Adam. He was a clever lad and he was very interested in everything and everybody. And he, he took a very strong interest in people, what they were doing, what they were thinking. He would love to love a debate or an argument or something like that. He was very personable and easygoing. Um, and he had two big themes in his life, which were friends and family. And um, so those were the things that mattered to him more than anything else. He's a bit lady, lazy about work, but because he was clever, he got away with it, which uh, annoyed everybody else around him. But, you know, he was a nice lad. He, um, about four months after we thought he'd be better, or less than that, in fact, um, he started to have some discomfort again when he discovered the cancer had come back. And what happens then is you can't use the same drugs again because they've become resistant to the, the cancer has become resistant to those drugs and you have to use different drugs. And different drugs are possibly less effective because if they'd use them, they'd been effective if you used them the first time. And the treatment they have then is to kill the immune system completely um, and then give you somebody else's stem cells, which is like, I liken it to being like a computer program where 
you've got a computer that's full of viruses and you decide to wipe everything out of its memory and start again. And that's what they did to Adam's immune system. And so he had a, a lot of radiotherapy, a lot of chemotherapy, and then he had to have um, a stem cell transplant. And that's where it gets difficult because you have to be a match. And being a match means that the person who is going to give you some of their stem cells has to match up with yours so your body doesn't reject the tissue because you could get very ill. And often, about 30% of people, the match is a brother or a sister. But for Adam that wasn't the case, none of his brothers were matches for him. So then you start a worldwide search for someone who has signed up to a stem cell register somewhere in the world and is a match. And we were very lucky in that we actually found two matches for Adam. One was in Germany and one was in the United States. And a 26-year-old lady in the United States gave her stem cells for Adam on November the 13th, I think. Um, and I remember him having them, and the infusion was simply like having the blood transfusion back into your body. Very simple, took 10 minutes. But those stem cells are flown over to the United States escorted by courier up from London and then to the Royal Liverpool Hospital where he had that done. And I, we're very grateful for that person. But the thing is, Adam was lucky. I know he didn't survive, but he was lucky because he had a match. There were lots of people out there for whom matches won't be found. And one of the big things is that people are scared of being stem cell donors. They don't know what it involves. It's dead easy. And uh, charities like the Anthony Nolan Trust um, DKMS for older people, they will, all you have to do is spit in a bottle, send it in a post, and then if you are, that, that's all the information they need, and then if one day you're a match for someone, you can save a life. And uh, that to me is so very, very important.